Hello and welcome to another special house call edition of our ACC 20 coverage. I'm Patrick Campbell, editor with HCP Live, and for this edition, I'll be joined by Dr. Deepak Bhatt, Director of Interventional Cardiovascular Programs at Brigham and Women's Hospital. In lieu of an in-person interview, as ACC 20 is completely virtual, Dr. Bhatt is joining us through a video chat to discuss hot topics from this year's conference. Dr. Bhatt, welcome. Great to be here with you. And now, just to start, I wanted to ask you first about this study into the performance of a novel, novel genetic risk score to identify risk of VTE in patients with cardiometabolic disease. Can you take me through that study and sort of the usefulness of this novel genetic risk score? Absolutely. It's a great question. A terrific uh, study, of course. The issue that's come up is how can we really best risk stratify patients, figure out who's at high risk and who isn't. And the reason that's important is if we know who's at high risk, we can target preventive therapies to them in terms of lifestyle modification and uh, potentially escalate medical therapy or target medical therapy. That's most relevant when one is talking about medical therapies that are more expensive branded medicines. It's also relevant when one is talking about medicines like antithrombotics where there's a bleeding risk. So uh, it is a way potentially of targeting therapies to patients most likely to benefit, least likely to be harmed, where things will be most cost effective. So that's the basic premise behind polygenic risk scores and why we need more than just current risk calculators for a variety of different disease states. Uh, we're talking about VTE here, but the same principles would apply for secondary prevention or other areas where polygenic risk scores are being introduced, certainly in terms of research, and you know, in some cases, people even pushing for clinical incorporation. Uh, it's been controversial, polygenic risk scores. It's not been clear how much they really add in a variety of different situations, but uh, in this particular analysis, it was an examination to see you know, what the ability might be in terms of BTE prediction. So quite novel in that regard. And certainly it did appear there was incremental value in terms of identifying different genotypes and the amount of risk they confer in this particular setting, as has been done in other settings, such as I alluded to earlier, secondary prevention, for example. I, I think, you know, the, the predictive ability is modest and one needs to acknowledge that fact, but I think it serves as a great platform for future research there's a lot we don't know about VT and why some people have recurrences, others don't. Who should be on lifelong antithrombotics? Who should be on a shorter duration? Should you keep the intensity of the antithrombotic high throughout the entire duration? Should you sort of de-escalate? All of these are questions that are really important ones and potentially the ability to more precisely risk stratify, including with use of polygenic risk scores, uh, might be useful, but much more research I think is needed in this area. Yeah, I agree. I definitely think it's an area to keep an eye on, but it's definitely something that needs more research in terms of a clinical uh, use. The next yeah. study I wanted to talk to you about was Tacagrelor and a look at the major adverse limb events. It was a systematic review and meta-analysis of the Pegasus and Timmy trials. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Right, uh, to, to be clear, the Pegasus and, and, and Themis trials, in fact. But, oh, but, um, right, but uh, yeah, it's from Greek mythology, not necessarily the most uh, well-known <laughs> character from Greek mythology, but nevertheless, um, uh, Pegasus and Themis both examined Tychagrelor in different populations, uh, but both positive studies. Pegasus examined Tychagrelor plus aspirin versus aspirin alone in patients who were one to three years post-MI, so stable post-MI patients, positive trial led to FDA approval of Ticagrel or 60BID on top of aspirin for those sorts of patients who are post-MI with multiple risk factors, multiple atherothrombotic risk factors, things like diabetes, for example, and who are at low bleeding risk. So that is uh, already an established therapy. And Themis, a bit more recent uh, data, but also a positive trial looking at stable patients with diabetes and with coronary artery disease as evidenced by prior stenting, prior PCI, prior cabbage, or medical management of their diabetes. And there too, the combination of Ticagrelor plus aspirin, again, Ticagrelor 60 BID plus aspirin, was superior to aspirin alone. So we know that that combo is effective at reducing the primary endpoint in each trial, which was cardiovascular death, MI, stroke. That's true in each individual trial. It's also true when you pull the data together. What was done nicely here was examining the effects on limb events. And as it turns out, in both trials, there is a significant reduction in limb events. Now, the absolute risk of limb events is relatively low because neither population was specifically enriched 
for PAD patients. But you can imagine, had it been PAD patients on top of either prior MI or diabetes, then the degree of risk reduction in limb events and probably also coronary and cerebral ischemic events would be even larger. But overall, the trials are quite concordant, showing significant reductions in MI, including big MIs, including ST elevation MI, significant reductions in ischemic strokes, and significant reductions now we're learning in peripheral ischemic events. So two trials, very concordant results, showing that in patients at sufficiently high ischemic risk, marked either by the presence of prior MI and Pegasus or diabetes and Themis, those sorts of coronary artery disease patients do seem to benefit from the combination of aspirin plus ticagalor versus aspirin plus placebo. Uh, there is an increase in bleeding, of course, one needs to be careful about that. But uh, nevertheless, in carefully selected patients, this seems to be a great therapy to not only reduce cardiac and cerebral ischemic events, but also peripheral ischemic events. All right, thank you for that analysis. That was very in-depth and thorough. Um, and now just lastly, before I let you go, I wanted to talk a little bit about LDLC lowering in the state of that. Uh, in February, we saw the approval of benpidoic acid and benpidoic acid combination with azidamide. Where are we with LDLC lowering? And do you think these new agents could potentially impact treatment algorithms or will people stick with PCSK9 and other ways of lowering LDLC? It's a great question. I don't know what's actually going to happen in practice. I do know what should happen, at least as far as the basics. So everyone that's being treated for elevated cholesterol really should be counseled on appropriate lifestyle management. Of course, different patients will have different degrees to which they embrace this. But the real key, I think, is making sure that all patients are adhering to lifestyle management. And that's true if they are on therapies. It's true if they're not on drug therapy. Sometimes patients start drug therapies and they say, I can have that extra piece of cake now. But you know that then just backfires and they don't get the full benefit of lipid lowering. So lifestyle management important uh, pre-medication and post-medication. As far as medications go, statins are first line for elevated LDL. No question about that. High intensity statins, if tolerated, are better than moderate intensity statins for most patients that are needing statins at all especially if they're high ischemic risk and tolerating it without side effects. And then I think the next in the line of therapies is xenomide, much more modest effect on LDL, but extremely safe. And also now generic, like most of the statins are. So that's first line therapy, statin, high intensity statin if needed, azetamibe added on if needed. And if the patient's statin intolerant, azetamibe would also be the first line therapy. The next in the sequence of evidence-based medicines would be PCSK9 inhibitors, where there's great data from Fourier and Odyssey showing reductions in important ischemic events. The risk reductions in those trials were relatively modest, but one needs to realize that they were relatively short-term trials in patients that were well-treated with statins and other therapies, and that probably to get the benefit of lowering LDLs in that range would take much longer than either study was actually conducted for. So uh, important advance, well-tolerated medicines, nothing bad that we saw in these trials in terms of cognitive dysfunction or intracerebral hemorrhage or other theoretical concerns people have been raising about statins, never shown to be true for statins either, but, but widely popularized on the internet. So um, I would say the next agent uh, in line is PCSK9 inhibitors. The major problems with those drugs is that they're injectable. Some patients don't like that. For other patients, that's not a big deal. Many people with diabetes, for example, are accustomed to GLP-1 agonists or insulin or that sort of thing. But for some patients, that can be a barrier. But the real barrier more so than that, I think, has been the cost. And even though both drugs that are FDA approved that are PCSK9 inhibitors have had cost decreases, the costs are still pretty high. And, and that's been a barrier in terms of wider spread use. Uh, but other than that, it's a great safe class of medications. And then finally, is bumpadoic acid, as you mentioned, seems to be quite effective at lowering LDL cholesterol. Uh, there is an outcome trial that's ongoing, but not yet complete. The drug is FDA approved for lowering LDL cholesterol. So I think it's another option in our armamentarium that I think is probably a good thing. I think it'd be nice to see what the outcome trial data show before too broadly embracing it, because uh, it's logical that LDL lowering by bempodoic acid, as with other mechanisms, should reduce cardiovascular risk. But sometimes we have been burned with those sorts of assumptions. LDL is, after all, still a surrogate market, even if it's a really good surrogate marker. So I think that, uh, in general, I would 
be waiting to use it until I've either failed and exhausted all other options, or it's a patient that won't take injections, can't tolerate statins, is eating my business, do the trick. I mean, there I think, you know, it's better than doing nothing, but I don't know that I would use it before those other evidence-based therapies without some outcome data, including the PCSK9 inhibitors. But part of it also will depend on what the cost is to the patient. I think that's also going to be a factor. I think you know, if the cost is really high to the patient, there isn't an outcome trial, that would be a couple of barriers against use, say, versus a PCSK9 inhibitor, where the cost may also be quite high, but where at least we have solid outcome data. So, you know, I think it's a bit of a complex decision. I think it might become much easier when there's actually outcome data for bempedelic acid, and I look forward to those. Okay, that was really about it from questions on my end. Was there anything else coming out of ACC20 that's unembargoed that you wanted to talk about before I let you go? I guess the really other big thing from ACC has just got to be COVID-19 and just all the discussion about it on social media and and around the meeting as well. And uh, it's a big deal. I mean, you know, most of us have, well, I shouldn't say most of us, all of us, none of us have, have lived through this type of epidemic. Really the last time there was something potentially like this was in 1918 with the flu pandemic and none of us were alive then. In fact, I don't think any of our parents were alive then for the most part. So there's really no first or secondhand experience. You can look in textbooks. There's a lot of great public health treatises about that particular pandemic, but it's different living through something versus reading about something. So, you know, it has been a really a disturbing thing, COVID-19. Uh, it's affecting healthcare workers. That means pretty much everyone in medicine knows someone that has COVID-19. And it's just affecting people in general, society at large. And this is um, really the issue of the day. And I think ACC uh, and the meeting really was quite useful in prompting and helping discussions around this. But I think it was also helpful in terms of trying to restore just the slightest degree of normalcy in terms of having a meeting. And I thought it was exciting doing it virtually. I think that's the future anyway of meetings uh, down the road. So um, while COVID-19 is a, a real tragedy, obviously on, on multiple levels, it has prompted us to move into the 21st century in this regard in terms of virtual education and virtual meetings a little bit more quickly than we otherwise would have. But I guess I'd conclude just by saying, you know, really I'd wish your viewers the best as they're dealing with COVID-19 in terms of their own practices, their patients, their families, their neighborhoods. It's, it's really a stressful time, I think, with this uh, pandemic and I really wish everyone the best. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's definitely a very strange time. Um, hard to believe, but two months ago, I'm not sure I would have believed someone if they said ACC would be a completely virtual meeting. And hats off to the ACC. Uh, the meeting has really been great so far, all things considered. But right. thank you again for taking the time to uh, speak with me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you.